You wake up every day angry. Uh, Sebastian, he is uh, like to say to whoever has my children that they please. We just hope that he's functioning autistic. Um. in life wherever you are just know that we are not going to stop this is reporter room with jessica della davies hello reporter room investigators great to see you come on in come on in i'm happy that you're here my name is Jessica Della Davies. I'm an investigative journalist. My job is to investigate crimes, crime scenes, and potential suspects and show you how to do the same thing. If you haven't subscribed, please do join the Reporter Room family. It's free and it helps us out a lot. So join our family. We would love to have you. We have so much stuff to dig into today on the Sebastian Rogers case. We are going to be talking about a variety of things, um, including pri the private investigator updates, narcissism, and what role this may have played in this trauma bonding, how it relates to Katie Proudfoot, and maybe narcissism and trauma bonding is something that you personally can relate to. We're going to talk about the new spokesperson, Tony Matheson. Um, the private investigator updates. So are you watching closely? Everything I'm sharing with you is my opinion and opinions are not facts. So please don't send any negativity to anyone. Please um, help me welcome all of our channel members, our subscribers and our mods and my deepest thanks to each and every one of you. I'm so glad that you're here. So come on in you guys. Um, so we're gonna talk about how narcissism is impacting the case in just a moment, but I wanna talk about this new private investigator situation. I'm just wondering if, if this type of relationship and the type of men that Katie chooses just don't treat her very nicely. And if she's, uh, and I, you know, Chris Proudfoot has come on to multiple YouTubers and he's even sought out women on Facebook to bully and intimidate, in my opinion. This is my opinion. And it's not a good look. Um, it's just not a good look. But let's take a look at, let me grab this really quick. Let me take this down. I'm going to, narcissists use trauma bonding and intermittent reinforcement to help get you addicted to them. This is according to survivors of DV. Um, so maybe this is something that's happened to you in your life. Um, so I just want to share with you a little bit about it so we can understand the cycle of how it works and how it may have impacted Katie um, and maybe consider looking at her in a different light than we have before. So the big question people always ask is why didn't he or she leave? Um, and, you know, and I, and I, I get why people want to ask that, but it doesn't always go make it that easy. And I know with, with Katie, if the stuff that was going on in Sebastian with Sebastian and Chris Proudfoot is true, and I'm not saying it is, but if, if some of the things that we've heard from, from the neighbors is true, then why didn't she just leave? It's, it's a very hard bond to break and the components necessary um, form a power differential followed by highs and very, very strong bonding and then big lows. So it's a bond that develops when two people undergo intense, risky, emotional experiences together. And in the context of an A relationship, I'm watching my words, this bond is strengthened due to heightened intimacy and danger. It's very similar to Stockholm syndrome um, as both the source of the terror and the comfort can be the same person. And, the, and then you're just trying to survive in this tumultuous relationship. And as a result, a lot of DV victims feel a misplaced, unshakable sense of loyalty and devotion to the perpetrators, I'm watching my words, which to you know somebody who has not gone through this may appear nonsensical. It just looks bizarre. But if you have gone through something like this, 
then you can probably relate to this. Maybe you had narcissistic trauma bonding with a partner, a, a spouse or a boyfriend. Maybe you had it with a parent. Maybe you had it with a sibling. Maybe you had it with a coworker. Um, but Dr. Patrick writes um, in the betrayal of the bond, trauma bonding, that it's especially fierce in situations where there are repetitive cycles. And we've heard, we hear all the time, how you know, the cycles of DV, the cycles of A, and I'm watching my words. So I think that you know, in light of what we know about Katie's mother, if this is true, it's alleged, if this is true, and she is a RSO registered, then did, was, is Katie just simply perpetuating this cycle into her adult life? So um, he writes, those standing see the obvious and these relationships about how insanely loyal or attached they share exploitation, fear, and danger. They also have elements of kindness, nobility, and righteousness. These are the people who stay involved or wish to stay involved with people who betray them. Emotional pain, severe consequences, and even the prospect of being done away with does not stop someone who is trauma bonded from being caring or committed. Clinicians call this trauma bonding. And this means that the victims have a certain dysfunctional attachment that occurs in the presence of danger, in the presence of shame. And we've seen this shaming tactic being used um, on social media by one of the, of the, of the adults in, in, of the three adults where he's, you know, gone in and tried to shame, mostly aimed at, at uh, female content creators or females on Facebook. So I do wonder what, if this is what was going on, what we, what's going on in the public where everyone can see it, it does make me wonder what is going on behind closed doors. What do you guys think? So I do want to talk about this a little bit. It, so what, how this works is it's, it's intermittent reinforcement in the context of psychological A. It's a pattern of cruel, callous treatment mixed in with random bursts of effect, affection. So the, the perpetrator hands out rewards such as affection, a compliment, gifts sporadically and unpredictably throughout the A cycle. And think of a DV husband who gives his wife flowers or kind words or a parent who does this to her child um, after a particularly harsh, silent treatment. So the intermittent reinforcement causes the person to seek the uh, person's approval. And I do feel like I see this with Katie. I do feel like I see her seeking his approval, his okay. Um, and I'm just wondering if this stems from what happened to her in her own childhood. And if this is something that was then perpetuated into her relationship with Sebastian. So seeking out the approval is like looking for breadcrumbs because you get these occasional positive behaviors in the hopes that this person will change and, and return to what was the honeymoon phase of the relationship. But we all know that that's not how it goes. It is a cycle. And victims who are unwittingly hooked into playing this game for a potential win when the truth is it's just a massive loss for the victim. So a manipulation tactic can also cause us to perceive rare positive behaviors as am in an amplified manner. So you see rare positive, and if you've been through this, then you can understand you know, what Dr. Carver is talking about here, because it causes you to see just little positive things being you know, huge, they're amplified. And uh, he talks about this in terms of love and Stockholm syndrome. He says, in threatening and survival situations, we look for a hope, a small sign that the situation may improve. When the controller shows the victim some small kindness, even though it's the A that benefits as well, the victim interprets that small kindness as positive trait in the relationship with this perpetrator, a birthday card, a gift, a special treatment. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know if you think this played a role in what happened to Sebastian or not. Please subscribe. And thank you so much for joining the Reporter Room family.